Hello and welcome! My name is Gabriel, and today we are going to be doing a deep dive into the work of Otessa Moshfeg. So, on May 1st, I got my copy of My Year of Rest and Relaxation in the mail. This is a book I've been looking forward to reading for a really long time, so I sat down thinking I'd just read a couple chapters, but instead I stayed up all night and I read the entire thing in one sitting. I thought that her writing was so shocking and bizarre and fresh and exciting, and I quickly became fascinated with her work. I spent the entire week watching just hours of interviews with her, trying to figure out her process and her inspiration. One week later, I found myself in a Barnes & Noble, and I bought three more of her books, and I ordered the one that I couldn't find in stores. I have spent the last month reading all of her books back to back, and now that I have finished them all, I want to give you my spoiler-free reviews as well as my ranking, but I also want to talk about her style and overarching themes and what I think a person can gain not just from reading one of these books, but from reading all of them. I think that these books are all incredible in their own unique ways, but I will be going in order of my personal preference, saving my favorite for the last. First up, I want to talk about one of the most bizarre books I have ever come across in my entire life, and that is McGlue. McGlue is a novella set in Salem, Massachusetts in 1851, and it follows a sort of romance between McGlue, a pirate with amnesia, and his best friend, a man that he doesn't remember murdering. Because the narrator, McGlue, has a severe brain injury, his grasp on reality is slipping, and so the story melds scenes from his past and present and his imagination into one continuous stream of thought. It is extremely disorienting and confusing, but also so inventive and unique. It's also written in this really choppy style to show McGlue's limited literacy. It's really effective for character building and giving him a really distinct voice, but it is also really hard to follow, especially when you combine it with the frequent time skips. Basically, everything that makes this book so cool and unique also makes it kind of incomprehensible. This book is a really hard sell because even though I loved it, I'm not entirely sure that I liked it. And even after having some time to sit with it, I'm not entirely sure I know what I read. And I haven't even mentioned how gross this book is. So Otessa Moshfeg is sort of known for two things. One is writing about loneliness and isolation, and the other is writing with a really brutal honesty about the body and its functions and just refusing to shy away from how disgusting it can be to be a person inhabiting a human body day after day. Those two themes go together excellently, and she explores them in one form or another in every single one of her books. Since McGlue was the first thing she ever published, it's really interesting to see how she introduced them. The character of McGlue is extremely isolated. He spends the book locked in a cell accused of a murder he doesn't remember committing, and he is suffering from a head injury and only has his limited memories and his pain to keep him company. He is acutely aware of his body and his pain because it is the only physical thing that he has to hold on to. And he's also a fascinating character because he insists on maintaining this facade of like rugged masculinity and strength even as he is writhing in pain. Even at his weakest and most vulnerable, he is doing everything he can to make himself seem disgusting and violent and evil. But as he tells this story, you can tell that he's experienced so much tenderness and love and he's afraid to tell you even after he's lost everything and it's heartbreaking. This book is baffling. It is choppy and violent and sparse and rancid and beautiful. Even though it is in last place on this list, it shows how daring Otessa Moshfeg is. It shows that she is unafraid to challenge conventional narrative structure to tell shocking, compelling, and utterly unique stories. Next, I'm going to be talking about her most recent publication, which is Death in Her Hands. I have mentioned this book quite a few times on this channel just because I have been obsessed with the cover for a long time, so I am very happy to have finally read it. Death in Her Hands is about Vesta Gull, an old woman who has recently moved into a cabin in the woods in a small town with her dog Charlie. While out for a walk one morning, she finds a note on the ground that says, Her name was Magda. No one will ever know who killed her. It wasn't me. Here is her dead body. And that is it. There is no dead body. There are no other clues. But Vesta has an overactive imagination and pretty severe anxiety. So this book is a psychological thriller driven entirely by her filling in the blanks, asking herself who was Magda, 
who killed her, what happened to her body, and she has absolutely no clues or evidence to go on. And that leads to a really weird, unique story, because there is no plot. It's just 300 pages of anxiety and thought spiraling. But you watch Vesta get so invested in this story that she has created, you start to question the reality of the story, and it becomes unclear what is real and what is made up. It melds reality with imagination in a really trippy, unreliable way. And it kind of makes you feel like you're going insane along with Vesta, as it forces you to question how much of the story is actually happening, and how much of it is just Vesta imagining and projecting. It is a very strange exploration of loneliness and anxiety, and it's got one of the best written, unreliable narrators I have ever come across. This definitely isn't my all-time favorite of her books, but I do think it is the smartest. The way that it uses foreshadowing and tone and, like I said, an unreliable narrator is just so smart and fascinating, and I, I think it should be taught in schools. Next in my ranking, we have a tie between Homesick for Another World and My Year of Rest and Relaxation. I cannot and will not choose between these two because I love them both dearly and equally. So just know that they are on equal footing, even though I'm going to be talking about Homesick for Another World first. This is a short story collection, which was published in between her debut novel, Eileen, and her mainstream breakout success, My Year of Rest and Relaxation. These stories feel really bizarre and absurdist when you're reading them, but they just sound so mundane when you describe the plots out loud. They're all basically just about people. People who hate their jobs, who hate their romantic partners, who just hate living, and who are all looking for something which will make the process of living a little more bearable. I feel like I should add that her writing is extremely funny. I haven't been clear enough about that yet. Granted, it is a pretty bitter, dark comedy that's being used to mask a deep sadness, but it did make me laugh out loud several times in all of these books. She likes to write from the perspective of really unpleasant, judgmental people who project their insecurities onto others, but they are all characters who are desperate for love or some kind of human connection that they have never felt. A New York Times reviewer once called Moshfeg the most interesting contemporary American writer on the topic of living when living is terrible, and that just nails the vibe completely. She's just incredible at writing the process of waking up every morning, completing a bunch of stupid little tasks, and then going to sleep every night and just hating every minute of it. <laughs> and in one interview, she was asked why she has such a hyperfixation on the body. And she said that she doesn't hyperfixate on it, she just doesn't want to ignore it like other writers do. There are so many gross little moments of daily life that are just the reality of inhabiting a body that so many writers ignore because they think they are unimportant or unglamorous or uninteresting. But she doesn't ignore them because she is fundamentally interested in capturing what it means to be a human who is living and breathing and eating and bleeding and crying. This book is just hit after hit of incredibly paced, riveting stories. They are a brutal and unflinching look at insecurity and desire, and each of them hit me like a slap in the face. Also, this is maybe my favorite cover of anything ever. Just... Ah. Now on to the one that you have probably heard many other people talk about, and that is My Year of Rest and Relaxation. Okay, this is the one that I read all in one night, so my notes are basically non-existent. I was in, like, a frenzy, and I just devoured it all at once. So, My Year of Rest and Relaxation is set in New York City in 2001. It follows an unnamed woman in her mid-twenties. She is wealthy and beautiful, and she went to a great college, and she got a job in the field that she wanted, but she is also just unbearably depressed. So she decides to medicate herself to sleep for an entire year, thinking that when her year of rest and relaxation is over, she will be reborn into a new life. One of the first thing that strikes you about this book is the narrator. She is so funny in, like, a bitter, unhinged way. It reminds me a lot of Esther in The Bell Jar, in that no matter how insane her actions get, she is so confident and compelling that you just go along with it. You're like, yeah, that's obviously what you would do in this situation. I've kind of jokingly been telling people that this book is The Bell Jar for people who've read The Bell Jar too many times and want something to make them feel worse. This book is kind of a direct callout for the self-indulgence that comes with a lot of depressive thought spirals. And it points out how you can ruin your own life if you romanticize your own wallowing too much. 
But it also makes you question if she is ruining her own life. You know, if she genuinely hates her job and she hates her friends, is she ruining her life by cutting them off? And is it really so terrible for her to take all of this time off for herself if she genuinely believes that it's what she needs to get better? This book will make you want to hate her because she's really bitter and judgmental and she's squandering all of these opportunities and she's privileged enough to be able to rest like this. And this book does look at privilege and who has the ability to properly rest and grieve. It asks you all of these questions and it just throws a lot at you, but it leaves you in a really uncomfortable place with no real answer. And I think that's part of why this book has blown up so much. Because not only does it have an incredible concept, but it just makes you want to talk about it. I don't have my copy with me today because I am currently forcing all of my friends to read it so that we can talk about it. And finally, we have reached my personal favorite, Eileen. This book is told from the perspective of an old woman looking back on her life when she was 24 years old, working at a prison for teenage boys and living with her alcoholic father, and it details the events of the week leading up to Christmas, 1964, the day that she ran away from her small town and never looked back. I want to start by saying how brilliant I think Eileen is as a narrator. The choice to make her an old woman so far removed from the events of the story that she's describing give it so much perspective and wisdom. But it's also unhinged in a way because she is removed enough from these events that she kind of has nothing to lose by being brutally honest. She can say with clarity how self-centered and naive she was, but she can also appreciate the woman that she used to be and know that she did what she had to do in order to get the life that she wanted for herself. This book reveals something really incredible about Otessa Moshfegh's writing, and it's that she explores isolation and loneliness as a way of reminding the reader that we are not alone. I think her narrators take on this very cynical tone as a way of avoiding real emotional vulnerability. And while Eileen puts on that mask for the outside world, she is completely vulnerable with the reader. And in many ways, Eileen is the most unpleasant of Mosh Fegg's characters. But she is also the one who is the most open about her desperation for love. Not only does she think that she is disgusting, but she is afraid that everybody else can see how disgusting she feels she is. This book frames that insecurity within the context of wanting to be attractive and desirable and lovable, and it is devastating. This book is also just bonkers. <laughs> Every single sentence reveals a brand new piece of insane information, and you just have to rapidly adjust your worldview in order to keep up. And the pacing is brilliant. You don't even realize that it's building and building until it just explodes. And there is a moment near the end of this that just made me shout, like, what? Out loud, alone in my bedroom. This book perfectly captures everything that is incredible about Otessa Moshfegg's writing. It is bitter and charming and tender and disgusting and violent and beautiful. This book will easily be among my favorites of the year, and it could quite possibly have a place among my all-time favorites. If you only read one of her books, make it this one, but I clearly recommend every single one of them. And that is all I have to say about Otessa Moshfegg. She has a new book that she's written called Lamp Vona, which is coming out in 2022. Uh, it's supposed to be about, like, feudalism and medieval fantasy and plague and, and a witch doctor. <laughs> I don't know. It's very strange. Not something I'd usually be drawn to, but I, I mean, I will clearly read anything that she publishes. I want to make videos like this a kind of series on my channel where I read and rank every single book by an author. I've got four Toni Morrison books left to read before I can do one for her, so expect one of those by the end of the summer, maybe? And then comment down below authors that you think I should check out. If you liked this video, give it a big thumbs up and comment down below your thoughts on any of these books, or just tell me what you've been reading lately. If you're new here, make sure that you hit subscribe as well as the bell icon so you get notified every single time I upload. That is all for today. I'll see you guys next time.